Uh, subject tonight is Rivka's power play, and let's get right to the subject. The parsha, of course, is Toldos, and it starts uh, with chapter 25, verse 19, Vela Toldos Yitzhak ben Avraham. These are the generations, or these are the offspring, or maybe the um, happenings of Yitzchak ben Avraham. Okay. Yitzchak, we've already met him in last week's Parsha. We know that he got married in last week's Parsha. Unfortunately, they're married for many years, um, 20 years, and they're childless, Yitzchak and Rivka. The Torah says, He marries uh, Rivka, but evidently she is barren. Because the Torah says, That uh, Yitzchak prayed to God, or he entreated God, lenochach ishto, opposite his wife, ki akarahi, because she was barren. And Hashem accepted his entreaty, but the harivka ishto and rivka, his wife, conceived. The word here, lenochach, is very unusual. I say that with confidence because the Ksava Kabbalah, my friend for the year and the subject of our studies uh, week by week, uh, says that this is the only use that we find anywhere in scripture of the word lenochach in the context of prayer. Uh, the Mepharshim generally understand this, and I think this is true for Rashi, it's true for the article translation, that Yitzchak prayed uh, to Hashem regarding his wife, lenochach ishto, on behalf of his wife, because she was barren, and Hashem answered his prayer. Now, Rashi, in a famous comment, takes it a bit further, and Rashi says, well, the word nochach does mean opposite in the sense of two people who are standing opposite one another, facing one another, or possibly even in opposite sides of a room or corners of a room. And Rashi says, lenochach ishto implies that she was praying and she was also praying. They were both praying. And then he, Rashi, explains the significance of the fact that the Torah says Hashem answered his prayer. And presumably they were praying for the same thing. And Rashi says, well, we see his prayers were more efficacious. But I don't want to go down that route. I've got something to say about that. We'll save it for another time. Rashi's comments uh, reflect, and that's, I'm sure, why Rashi you know, introduces that, that approach, uh, the word lenochach, which means opposite. But what is its relevance to prayer? And according to Rashi, well, there is no relevance to the prayer itself. And it tells us something about the context, about the positioning of the two parties when they were praying to Hashem. And their prayer was answered, although the Torah says it was Yitzchak's prayer who was answered. Let me tell you what uh, Ksara Kabbalah says. I think it's very, besides being very clever, I think it's very close to the pshat. We'll see later on a comment. Uh, that I'd like to explore together, which is probably a drash. But this one, I think, is very close to the pshat, to the simple meaning, because of, as, as I say, the word nochach. To say the Torah is um, emphasizing, or that we need to know that they both prayed, and they were opposite one another, and that his prayer was answered, and her prayer was not answered, it, it's fascinating, important, but it kind of is a diversion. Here's Rivka's power play, according to Ksava Kabbalah. The word, le, the word nochach, which means facing or opposite, is derived, he says, from the word vikuach. Vikuach is an argumentation or disputation or a debate. Lehit vakeach is to dispute or to argue. It doesn't have to be acrimonious argument. It can be a, 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 um, an argument of uh, colleagues or, or friends. It can be certainly an argument in the Shem Shamayim as well. It doesn't emphasize the sort of um, the hostility. It doesn't have that connotation necessarily. But it does mean that each one is seeking to persuade the other or maybe to persuade an audience or dare I say to persuade a judge that he's in the right. So he adduces evidence, proof, argumentation, um, uh, any kind of cogent, compelling basis to persuade the listener that he's in the right. That's the root of the word nochach from the word vikuach. And the root of the word vikuach is koach. Vikuach is vav, chaf, ches. The root of it, he says, not my own idea, is koach. And of course, that's the nature of a vikuach. Each one seeks to marshal the strength that he has 
uh, or that he can call upon to, again, convince his disputant or convince the judge or the jury or the listeners, as the case may be, or, or, or the public, you know, if it's a political debate, as the case may be. So where is the power? He says that Yitzchak prayed because of the urging or the insistence of his wife. That's why I say this is Rivka's power play. Why did she need to insist to him that he should pray? Why did she have to prod him to pray? Ksava Kabbalah says something novel, but I think he's got a valid point if you want to take it to the furthest extent. Yitzchak was a holy, pious, devout, spiritually exalted personality. He, in a way, was the most perfect of the avos. I've said many times, although perhaps you haven't heard it from me, um, for those of who have joined our series recently, that Yitzchak was the ideal Jew. Yaakov was the real Jew, but Yitzchak was the ideal Jew. He was ideal in the sense that he was an Ola Tamima. He was like an all burnt offering because he nearly was sacrificed on the altar. And as I would like to put it, once he was elevated onto the altar, he never really got his feet back on the ground. He lived his life with a closeness to Hashem that was, I'm sure, unique in his day and maybe unique in all time. He was a person whose uh, uh, spiritual um, aspirations were of such a quality that his uh, worldliness was diminished. And that is reflected in the fact that he didn't even seek a wife for himself. Rabboni Shalom, he's 40 years old. You think he'd like to, uh, or, you know, take some initiative in finding a wife, go to a shadcha and, you know, saw you at Sinai. I don't know if they had it in those days, probably not. But, you know, the Torah makes it clear that Abraham needs Yitzchak to get married. So he summons his servant and sends him to Padan Aram to find a wife for Yitzchak. What's Yitzchak's agency in it? Because Yitzchak's avoda did not naturally take the form of something as practical and pragmatic as finding a wife. Therefore, once he married her, it says he loved her. And I'm not suggesting their relationship was uh, superficial or, or, or deficient in any way. But it may not have come naturally for him to pray for children because he, although it's a bit strange for, for our way of thinking, but his told us, like Rashi says about Noah, Ela told us Noah, the primary told us of a righteous person is Masem Hatofim, his good deeds. So for Yitzchak, he naturally thought of his legacy in terms of his Avodas Hashem. So again, it's a kind of extreme position. Uh, we wouldn't think that another uh, a spiritual heroic personality would fail to think about his wife's childlessness. But according to the uh, paradigm of Yitzchak as the one who is elevated and he doesn't have his feet on the ground that much. So uh, although we find later on he is quite successful in, in uh, material affairs, we'll see that very, very soon. But nevertheless, it's consistent with the vision of Yitzchak. And therefore he explains, it was through the insistence, through the, the, the almost um, the instruction of his wife that he prayed for her. And his prayers, of course, were answered. So this is according to the koch, the power of his wife, his wife, you know, empowered him, let's say. But then he has another approach as well, which is that the word lenochach, deriving from the word koach, lenochach ishto, he sought to empower his wife. In other words, let's take another look at the post. Please, I hope you have a chumash with you. V'yetar yitzak l'ashem lenochach ishto, the word lenochach actually implies the content of his prayer. His prayer was that his wife should have the power to give birth, the power to conceive, the power for, for um, fertility. And uh, this um, use of the word koach is not unusual. We had it in Parshas Bereshis. Hashem said, after the hate of eating from the tree, of tree of knowledge. So Hashem said to Adam and Chava, 
lo sosif teis kochalach, the earth will no longer uh, like provide its power for you. Meaning you, Adam, will have to endeavor greatly to coax from the, from the earth grain or uh, produce, fruit, and vegetables, and that which will enable you to eat. It will, the earth will not produce it naturally and automatically and effortlessly as in the past. In any case, we find the expression, so we see that the capacity for productivity for, for the fruit of the earth is expressed in the word koach. So according to that, when the Torah says lenochach ishto, it could mean that his prayer was that his wife, his that ishto, his wife, should have the koach, that she should have the um, uh, capacity, the natural capacity to conceive and to carry a, a uh, an infant, uh, an embryo to to term, and should uh, should bear a child. And of course. That was successful, as we know, in the sense that, that she bore twins. And the benefit to this approach is that the Torah is actually telling us about the content of his prayer. Otherwise, we can only infer from the context that he prayed opposite his wife because she was barren. And Hashem accepted his prayer and she conceived. So from the context, it's evident that his prayer was about childlessness. But the Torah doesn't tell us that. But according to this Peshat, the Torah does. Lenocha, and the Torah is also saying Lenocha, where they were positioned when at the time of this prayer. According to what we're suggesting now, the Torah does tell us about the content of the prayer. Lenocha chishto. His prayer was that his wife should have the koach, the power and the capacity to, to bear a child. So this is um, an example of the close analysis of the words and the actual appreciation of the meaning of the words sheds a different and a new light. And I would suggest a more, in some ways, a more profound light on the meaning of the Torah. We'll see some other examples of that uh, right now. Uh, let's turn to chapter 26, the next parak, Pasuk Tes Zion, verse 17, 16, excuse me, verse 16. Vayomer, Avimelech el Yitzchak. So Yitzchak has, uh, there was a famine and Yitzchak was on his way evidently to Egypt. Hashem said, don't go to Egypt, stay where you are. So he stayed, he lived out the famine, he suffered through the famine. Seems that although others were indeed enduring privations because of the famine, but Yitzchak, of course, with the blessing of Hashem, prospered to the point that in Pesach Tezayin, if you've got the stone Chumash, it's page 130, um, uh, I'm sorry, Avimelech el, el Yitzchak. so Avimelech said to Yitzchak, Leich me'imanu, move on, ki atzamta mimenu me'od, because you're too rich for us. In English it says, uh, you have become much mightier than we. Atzamta mimenu me'od. In the previous verses, you can see it further up on the page, we have the mea sha'arim, the hundredfold uh, uh, yield, and we have that he has become wealthy with uh, um, uh, cattle and livestock and um, other, other acquisitions. And therefore, it's evident that Avimelech, and representing that he was the king of the Plishtim, the Philistines, uh, they're jealous of him and they drive him away. So this, you know, is a kind of um, har, uh, a forerunner, it foreshadows a very popular anti-Semitic canard, which has not let, yet lost its toxicity and its popularity. And that is the criticism of the Jew for being too successful, for being financially um, uh, prosperous. And then he's criticized and sometimes driven out because of that. <speaking in Hebrew> Uh, you could say, and, and why are they driving away just because he's wealthy? Uh, you know, if he's successful, then uh, why, why does that trouble them? So at the simple level, it's just income inequality. They're saying, you know, we're poor, you're rich, you don't belong here, get, get lost. Uh, I don't know anything about the woman, so I don't mean to say anything unkind, but there's a Vietnamese woman who you may have read in the press uh, recently, who has given a grant, a gift to Oxford University, 155 million pounds from a wealthy woman, the, the richest woman in Vietnam, she's giving to Oxford University. And they're changing the name of the university, they're naming it for her. Okay, very nice. Now, uh, 
I mean, for Oxford University, it's great. I suppose for Britain, it's very good. It's all money. And uh, yeah, lo lovely. But I wonder what the Vietnamese man in the street thinks about the fact that this woman has become super wealthy and she's giving 155 million pounds to Oxford University. I mean, talk about income inequality. Okay, look, that, that's a fact of life. But I'm just saying as an example, it can arouse maybe some animosity, but there's something further than that as well. And this is probably hinted to in the posture and I've heard it actually uh, from other sources as well, but Xavier Kabbal explains it in the actual choice of words. Take a close look at the Pasu, please. Tazayin. Leave from us, depart. So Xavier Kabbal says, if it just was a way of saying you have become very wealthy, then it should have said, You are much too wealthy for us. You don't belong here because you're too rich. Get lost. You are much wealthier than us. But because it says the mem in mimenu means that you are wealthy from us. You've taken our money. You're rich because you've exploited us because we had the famine. And in the famine, you had plenty of grain. You were selling grain and food and produce in the famine, you are commanding top dollar for your product. Therefore, you made a fortune. Therefore, you become very wealthy and your wealth has been at our expense because we're paying you whatever it is for a bushel of apples or whatever it is for a kilo of grain. And therefore, you become rich from us. Therefore, we don't like you. And of course, as I say, this is an anti-Semitic canard. Look, in some uh, isolated instances, maybe so. I'm not saying no Jew has ever engaged in profiteering, but the impulse of some have called it the, 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 the politics of jealousy, but it is even worse. The impulse to, to see someone's success and say he's exploited us, he's fleeced us, he's taken it from us, and therefore he's the, uh, the villain of the piece. Unfortunately, this is a... Uh, uh, a movie that we as Jews have seen uh, many times before, it does not end well. Interestingly, says Xavier Kabbalah, please look forward with me a few verses further on page 130, if you got the art scroll, page 132, it's the end of Ravii. So it's Pasu Chavtes. So they drive him out and Yitzchak ends up in Be'er Sheva. And then they catch up with him in Be'er Sheva. And finally they say to him, Ata, ata, Baruch Hashem. Now we see that you're blessed of God because you've moved on. You've been, you're around Beersheba. You're not exploiting the Philistines anymore and you're still very wealthy. You're still very successful. Ata, ata, you now we see Baruch Hashem. You are blessed of God. Your success doesn't come because you've exploited us. Your success comes by divine blessing. Hashem has blessed you. So they finally came around to the right way of thinking. Maybe when they saw their economy suffered by Yitzchak's departure. But okay, that's just my speculation. But again, putting the Jewish history and that uh, those comments aside, the the uh, hint, which I think is a compelling hint in the pasuk, is that it says Kiatzamta Mimenu Maod. The word. Mimenu, it's get samta mimenu. You have become rich from us, mo'o, to a very great extent. You've become rich from us. And that is hinted to, as I said, in the sequence of words. Otherwise, it would have we would have expected it to say, Kiat Samta Ma'od, Mimenu, you've become much greater, much wealthier than us. But there's more than that, as we've said. Finally, I want to uh share with you an approach with, which I think what we just said by the now is also the Pshat. I think it it very well you know, maybe the, the straightforward meaning of the text. What I want to share with you now is possibly more in the drash category. I find it uh, fascinating, though, and certainly worth our study together in the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have of our shiur tonight. It's chapter 27, 27. So chapter 27, verse 27. Now, we are in the midst. Uh, this pasuk is in the midst of the... Uh, um, arrival of Yaakov, bearing the food prepared by his mother, wearing the um, skin of the goats on his arms, which are intended to make his father or convince his father or sort of validate 
in his father's perception, the identity of Yaakov as Asaph. And of course, this is the great impersonation. I'm not going to deal with that per se, but just to set the stage, of course, the story itself is very well known. So it says in that verse in Pasuk Chafzai, uh, in the very top of page 138, if you have the art scroll um, uh, stone, Chumash, uh, he approached him and he kissed him, and he uh, smelled the aroma of his clothing, and he blessed him. Vayomer, and he said, Re'ei reach b'ni, behold, see, the aroma, the, the, the scent of my son, kereach sadeh, is like the scent of the field Hashem be'rachoh Hashem that God has blessed. And that's where the sixth aliyah ends, by the way. The next pasuk continues, Vayitain l'cha ha'elokim ital ha'shamayim, may God give you of the dew of heaven, etc. Now, what is interesting is, <clears throat> the blessing that Yitzchak bestows on Yaakov, okay, he thought it was Asa, but actually what we're going to say now is not so much dependent on the exact identity of who he is. Whether Yitzchak still had a nagging doubt that this might not be Asa, or maybe he in fact knew that it was not Asa, but he recognized it was somehow the divine intent that this should be the bracha, and this should be the recipient of the bracha, or if he was you know, completely um, uh, convinced that it was it was Yaakov, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, the blessing that he gave him, if you look in the verses that follow, have to do all with material, corporeal, uh, financial success, prosperity, and the like. There's nothing there about inheriting the land of Israel. There's nothing there about spiritual legacy. There's nothing there about uh, the gift of um, closeness to Hashem. There's nothing there about being the progenitor of a great nation. What we have in these verses is success, material success. Okay, it's only two psukim, but nevertheless, every word counts. And there's, there's, it's only about wealth and prosperity, etc. The kind of bracha, which, by the way, Esau would have been delighted to receive. And according to this simple understanding, of course, Yitzchak thought he was blessing Esau. Question is, says Ksava Kabbalah, that's a very obvious question. If that is the blessing that Yaakov sought to um, claim, sought to and uh, you know endeavor to, to uh, successfully wrest from his father, that it should go to him and not to Esau then what's all the excitement about? Is it really worthwhile for Rivka and for Yaakov to collude? And Yaakov was a reluctant participant and Rivka was really uh, not just encouraging him, but insisting and instructing him. Why did they do it? Just for that bracha, tala shma hashamayim shmanei haaretz, for the, the material success. Was that, was that all there is? It's impossible that that's all there is. So, Says Zuxava Kabbalah, and the he says Mafarshim would agree with this as well. Meaning, this if you've got, and if you think about it closely, there is one word, a single word, which can be understood to encompass the primary bracha, the bracha of Brichas Avraham, the blessing that Hashem gave to Avraham, and that Avraham transmitted to Yitzchak, and Yitzchak is transmitting it to his firstborn, or so he thought. And that is the word vayivar cheyu. That's why I said we're in Pasuk 27. Vayigashvi shakal, he approached him. He kissed him. He uh, enjoyed the scent of his clothing. Vayivar cheyu, and he blessed him. Says Xava Kabbalah, we must conclude that this word vayivar cheyu is when he conveyed to uh, his son, whoever it may be, the bracha of Avraham. That is Vayivarche. He bracha, gave him a bracha. And this is can be understood. I mean, it's uh, uh, can be validated by the fact that in the next verse, in 28, in Pasuk Chavches, how does it begin? Why the Vav? I'm holding my finger up as a letter Vav. Why the Vav? And this many of the Mepharshim speak about. Why the Vav? The Vav implies that in addition to what I've said previously, I've got more. 
Again, other Mephoshim draw attention to that as well. But at the simple level, Vayitena Chalukim, etc., suggests that in addition to what I've already given you, I've got more to give you as well. According to that, Vayivar Chehu encompasses the whole brach of Avraham, which is the, the most important brach of all. The problem is, my friends, that this is very odd, and that's what he himself says. The, the Torah spells out Vitein Chalukim as Mitala Shemaim Shonah Aras Rov Dagon Vitzirosh Yavdu Chamim Yishtachavul Chalu. All of that is um, expressed in lucid, um, almost uh, uh, evocative, uh, picturesque language, and that is secondary. That's Vitein Lecha, but the primary bracha is just included in one word, which with no elaboration, that is strange. With that in mind, he suggests the following, and I uh, will share it with you for your uh, consideration. I think it has a lot to commend it, and you can decide for yourself if you agree. Vayivar Chayu says, Ksav Kabbalah, the bracha of Vayivar Chayu, the blessing, the candidate of the blessing is in the words that follow. Take another look, please. You've got to look closely at it. That's why I've encouraged you to have a chumash. I know you all do. But there's another half to the verse. See, the aroma of my son is as the aroma of the field that was blessed by God. Says Xavi Kabbalah, the content of the bracha that he gave him is in those words. Reach b'ni. Again, why the, all the attention to the reyach? Rashi has a comment, which we'll get to actually in, in a couple of minutes, uh, about why the ref. And Rashi also is aroused to um, explain why the reference to the aroma, what's so important about the aroma. It's true, we understand the need for the touching. And it's true that Yitzchak's eyes, eyesight was failing. So it's logical that he's drawing on other senses. He comments about the voice. He comments about the, the feel, the touch. And he touches him because he wants to feel him. Are you really Esav? And uh, of course, he's going to taste the Mat Amim. And therefore, at a certain level, we can say it was not surprising that he deals with aroma as well, because it's common that a person who loses a certain uh, sense, the others are sharpened. But that's kind of simplistic. Says the Ksava Kabbalah, to get to the point, he says, reach b'ni, reach, an aroma is associated with deeds, with action. Good deeds are likened to a fragrant aroma. Uh, uh, evil and wicked misanthropic deeds are likened to a malodorous uh, scent. He gives some examples. He says, Masehat <laughs> to something which produces a pleasant aroma, <laughs> or that which has become putrid and malodorous. And we find a few examples of Vereach Lo Kalavanon. It has an aroma like, like the, the, um, the Lebanon. We have in uh, the beginning of Shmos, we have Hiv Ashtem Es Reichenu. The people say to Moshe and to Aharon, because you've antagonized Pharaoh, so you have caused us to stink in their, uh, uh, in, in their view, in their, in their uh, perception. You've caused our aroma to become putrid, and therefore they hate us. The Egyptians are angry with us because you've come in and insisted that we should have uh, uh, days off to go sacrifice in the wilderness, which, of course, Pharaoh was, is not going to allow, has not allowed. That's the positive scene. We find many, many other examples. Uh, of course, the very famous example we all know about the Arba Minim, the four uh, species in which uh, that we use on Sukkot, in which the Etrog is likened to a person who has good deeds because it has a fragrant aroma. Or the tamara, the, um, the, the date, uh, has no reach. It doesn't have any scent. It has a taste, but it has no scent. So it's like a person who has no ma'asim tovim, although he has maybe Torah learning in the case of the, of the tamar. And similarly, we find other examples of this. 
the point is that the rate, and he even gives an example from Germany, he says in the German language, we have it in English as well. You know, if we say something, something smells uh, rotten or smells malodorous or something like that, I mean, it can be meant literally, but it's often meant um, uh, as, a, as a metaphor also. So this uh, imagery of the reyach, he says, refers to ma'asim. He says to the bracha is that your deeds should be deeds that are, are um, fragrant. Your behavior, your life should be a life that um, metaphorically uh, exudes a fragrant aroma. When he says re'ei re'ach b'ni, he says, it mean, the meaning is this, atadze b'ni b'char l'cha t'chunas ha'reyach Choose for yourself, he says to his son, a, a lifestyle which is fragrant, a lifestyle which exudes a favorable and a fragrant aroma. The word re'e, again, if you notice in the Pesach, he, he, Yitzchak says, re'e, see, so the word re'e also means to choose, like Yosef told Pharaoh, yire. Pharaoh ish navon. Pharaoh should see, should seek. And maybe there's a connection between those words, even in English language, to see and to seek. Seek out, choose, select a, 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 a person who is navon, who is wise to be the minister of an interior or the commerce or whatever it might be. That's what Yosef advised Pharaoh with regard to the years of plenty, the years of famine to follow. Yere Farah. So Sava Kabbalah says the word re'e means to choose. So he is addressing his son and he says, re'e, see, choose, re'ach b'ni, choose a lifestyle which uh, um, uh, produces, again, metaphorically, a fragrant aroma. And then he goes further, and this is sophisticated, so bear with me just for a couple of minutes. He says that a fragrant aroma can adhere to a garment, to a fabric, to a room. You can go into a room with a fragrant aroma. There are some rooms in the house that may have a fragrant aroma, but it may not be natural. It may be because a uh, room freshener is used in order to um, uh, impose fragrance upon that space. But there are other types of aroma or other occasions where the object itself naturally emits a fragrant aroma, uh, uh, mint or, or herbs or flowers are naturally fragrant. That is to say the fragrant comes within. Says Xavah Kabbalah, the Rambam in Shmona Prokim in this famous introduction to this commentary on Pekei Avot in chapter six, if you want to look it up, it's uh, the intro to, to Pekei Avot, chapter six. Not, the, not chapter six in Pirkei Avot, the introduction to Pirkei Avot, which is called eight chapters, it's chapter six. And there the Rambam speaks of the Chassid and the Kovesh Es Yitzro. Bear with me. The Chassid is the person who is innately righteous. The Kovesh Es Yitzro, who suppresses his evil inclination, is a person who is also righteous, but he has to struggle to be righteous. His Yetzahara plagues him, tempts him, lures him, attracts him, and he has to overcome his Yitzhahara. The Hasid is the person who is by his very nature above the blandishments of the Yitzhahara. The Hasid and the Kovesh Es Yitzro. Says the Ksana Kabbalah, the Kovesh Es Yitzro is like the person who has a fragrant aroma, but it's only imposed from without. It's only sort of um, um, imposed uh, uh, upon it or upon him, upon the, the person. The Kavish Yitzra is one when the circumstances uh, demand that he rises to the occasion and overcomes his Yitzhahara. So that's like the fragrance that is imposed upon it. He's got a uh, perfume or cologne that he is able to apply. Now he smells great, but he may not naturally smell like a rose. The Chassid is the one who, following the metaphor, is naturally fragrant. And now we can understand why it says, Reach b'ni kerech sadeh, it's like a field, asher Hashem, that is naturally fragrant. 
a person who who walks into a to a forest or a field or or, or a garden that's planted with fragrant herbs and and, and things like that and flowers uh, you know new mown hay it's not good if you have hay fever but it's it's a delight for the senses that is what to which he likens his son so the bracha is he says to Yaakov or a sub it could be either one I mean it is Yaakov but Yitzchak whether he knows it or doesn't know that's what I said uh, that according to Ksav Kabbalah, he is blessing him. He says, you should be the kind of person who exudes a fragrant aroma, whose actions and whose deeds are inherently righteous. And then Hashem will bless you. And finally, and I know we're in a couple few minutes of overtime, but he ends by saying that the uh, this is why it, the, the reference to the garden, the field that Hashem has blessed, he says that... Uh, Adam Harishon, Adam and Eve, when he was in the Garden of Eden, before he was banished, before he committed the sin, he had no Yetzirah. His only impulse, his only inclination, his only desire, his only natural uh, state was of righteousness. It didn't last. But again, that's the idyllic state of Adam HaRishon. That's why there's a reference to the garden that Hashem has blessed. And that's what Rashi says when Yaakov entered uh, Yisrael felt the, the Reich of Gan Eden is here as well. And that's the meaning of the statement that Shufrei de Yaakov to Shufrei de Adam, that Yaakov was as beautiful as Adam. It doesn't just mean he was a model for GQ or something like that. He was a, you know, uh, uh, George Clooney, whatever you think. I don't know what he looks like even. But it means that his beauty, his inner beauty was like Adam HaRishon. This is because of the bracha that Yitzchak gave him, that he recognized within him, and he gave him that, that blessing. So I'm sorry, we're a bit into overtime, just to review as we like to. We said, two possibilities. It may be at the urging and the insistence of his wife, because it didn't occur to him to pray for children. He was too exalted for that spiritually almost you know uh didn't have his feet on the ground that's one possibility he prayed because she told him you got to pray for me otherwise there's going to be no action here the other possibility is he prayed that she should have the power that is to say the power of fertility the second thing we said is that you have become wealthy through us this is the old age-old anti-semitic canard and uh, it's hinted to because it says Ma'od at the end, at some time men, you've become wealthy from us. You've taken our wealth. It was only afterwards when they saw he went to Beersheba, he was also very successful there. And they realized, actually, your bracha comes from Hashem. And finally, we've said, V'yivarchehu, the bracha V'yivarchehu, that is the whole content of the main bracha. But it's hinted to in the words that follow. The bracha is, be the person who produces a fragrant aroma wherever you go, and then you will indeed be blessed of Hashem. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish everybody Shabbat Shalom.